Thanks to Brilliant for supporting this episode of Journey to the Microcosmos. Go to brilliant.org slash microcosmos to check out their scientific thinking course and get 20% off an annual premium subscription. You've heard some worm horror stories, right? We were looking some up just for this episode and came across a recent headline from Ars Technica that read, Army of worm larvae hatch from man's bum, visibly slither under his skin. And if that's not enough to terrify you and make you feel very uncomfortable, there's always the stories of painful stomach cramps or diarrhea or nausea that eventually turns out to be caused by some worms that have taken up residence inside someone's intestines. It is terrifying and wild to think of something so much smaller than us causing so much havoc. So, as we watch the cilia lining a worm's gut beat its own soothing pattern, wouldn't it feel like almost a little bit of justice if this site wasn't so peaceful? Like, what if worms had to worry about their own guts being taken over by a parasite? If you found yourself in this position, seeking some schadenfreude over a worm, we have some good news for you. The worm you see in the middle of this tank is currently hosting this strange fellow, called a radiophyra. James, our master of microscopes, had been on the hunt for the radiophyra after seeing this, two radiophyras linked together in a chain as one divided to make more copies of itself. It had come from the inside of one of the worms that he'd been watching when he'd accidentally squeezed a worm a bit too hard under the cover slip and caused the ciliate to pop out. Radiophyra belong to a general group of ciliates called astomes or astomated ciliates. We've talked about ciliates a lot on our channel, which means that if you've been watching for a while, you may have picked up on the fact that from time to time, we have said that most ciliates have an oral groove, that opening lined with cilia that sweep bacteria and algae and other tiny bits of food into the organism. We've seen that oral groove at work in ciliates like stenters and paramecium, functioning as the ciliate equivalent of a mouth. But as we have always said most ciliates, you will have inferred that this does not mean all ciliates. And if you are looking for an exception to the rule, astomes are that exception. Astomated ciliates are diverse, but they are unified by one shared feature, or rather, they are unified by their lack of one shared feature, a mouth. And they do not need a mouth because they have something even better. They have worms. As tomated ciliates do parasitize animals other than worms, some live inside mollusks, others inside leeches, or even in amphibians, but they are most commonly associated with the guts of annelid worms. So when James found his radiophyra, he decided to see if he could find more of them in the other worms that were in his samples. And that meant that our master of microscopes had to become a master of worm surgery, dissecting them so that he could draw out the ciliates living within. Inside this particular aquatic worm were these astomated ciliates. From a distance, they also look like worms. But as you get closer and closer, their shape becomes more definite, except for, you know, the massive amounts of fluff around them, a dense cloud of cilia beating away. Unfortunately, there is not a lot of research on this ciliate. In fact, there isn't a lot of research on astomated ciliates in general. They just aren't destructive enough or common enough to have become either a necessary or convenient research subject. In fact, it's not even clear whether or not we should call them parasites. Modern day papers will sometimes refer to them as endosymbionts instead, because we don't know a lot about whether astomated ciliates are doing much to their worm hosts, bad or good. But the worm gut does plenty for the astomated ciliate. At one point in time, the ancestors of these ciliates did have mouths, but as they found their way into worms, and specifically their guts, those oral grooves became less necessary. Instead, the ciliates could rely on a form of feeding called osmotrophy, where they simply 
absorb nutrients from their surroundings through osmosis. Instead of taking in larger bits of food through their mouths and breaking it down themselves, as tomated ciliates could just take advantage of the worm's digestive system to do all of that breaking down for them. As the worm's digestive enzymes break down complex molecules into simpler forms that can travel through their own intestinal walls, some of those nutrients would just go to feed the astomated ciliate instead. These ciliates will actually sometimes be picky about making sure they're in a particular spot within their host's intestinal tract. And once they've found the right spot, the ciliates will hold themselves in place with organelles that range in shape. Some use hooks, others spines, maybe even suckers. The flat shape of the ciliates helps them stay pressed to the epithelium of the intestines. So while these ciliates may not need a mouth anymore, they have found other traits necessary to their survival. As tomated ciliates are found in hosts from all sorts of environments. Some live in soil, some live in ponds, some even live in ocean waters. And scientists are using the general tools available now to try and piece together how host and endosymbiont have shaped each other. And we can see some of that intertwined story in the ciliate's mouthlessness, but the specifics of that evolutionary change are laid out in their DNA, as are the more hidden parts of that shared history. Now, we cannot know whether the worms have any feelings about their guts being home to another organism. They likely do not have much choice in the matter, but they also likely are not prone to emotions like resentment in the way that we might resent a worm parasitizing our bodies. But if they were to have feelings on the matter, we want to offer this one last detail about astomated ciliates. Many of them have their own endosymbionts as well bacteria that live inside them, with perhaps their own history tangled up with their ciliate host's story as well. Now, we couldn't find those bacteria in our parasitic friends, but we like the idea that somewhere out there are these nesting dolls of endosymbionts, an organism that is an organism, but an organism that is also a home buried within other homes. Thank you for coming on this journey with us as we explore the unseen world that surrounds us. And thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this episode. Brilliant features hands-on interactive courses in science, engineering, computer science, and math. And Brilliant has recently upped the interactivity of their courses. In their scientific thinking course, you'll dive into the world of scientific principles by exploring the laws of physics and principles of engineering. Along the way, you'll gain the understanding and insight needed to start looking at the world in a different way. The courses are designed for people of all levels, so you can jump in at any point and work your way to mastery. And Brilliant courses are also available offline using their iOS and Android app. So if you're traveling or have a spotty internet connection, you'll still be able to keep learning. If you're interested in learning more, you can get 20% off an annual premium subscription at brilliant.org slash microcosmos. The folks on the screen right now, they are our Patreon patrons. This world of ours just doesn't stop being interesting. There's always something else ready to blow my mind, and I'm so glad that we can continue on our journey to find and share those things. And the people here, they are the reason that we can do that. So thank you all so much to all of you. And if you're interested in joining them, you can check out patreon.com slash journey to micro. If you want to see more from our master of microscopes, James Weiss, you can check out jam and germs on Instagram. And if you want to see more from us, there's always a subscribe button somewhere nearby. <laughs>